Hi, let's talk about Git, LFS, GitHub and why we need this. I will introduce you to the most important Git commands and Git LFS. Then I show you how you can use a Git integration of Rider and Git Blame to find the appropriate commit and video for each line of code. This way you can jump into the video that teaches about the specific implementation detail that you want to learn more about. Finally, we will publish the project and I will give you some tips how you can organize your game development team with GitHub and alternative tools. Git is a version control system that tracks file changes and supports collaborative, distributed, non-linear workflows in software development teams. So what's the benefit for you? Whenever things got messed up in your projects, and believe me, this is going to happen, you can travel back in time to an earlier state of your project when everything was just working fine. GitHub, on the other hand, is a developer platform based on Git, where you can host and backup your code in private or public repositories, organize your project and collaborate with members of your team or users all over the world. This tutorial series is hosted on GitHub too. In the description of each video, you'll find a link to a commit on GitHub that reflects the state of exactly that video. So whenever you struggle with something, you can always look into my source code. And if you prefer not to watch the whole playlist, you can just clone the repository, check out a commit and jump into the series at any point. If you don't have Git, let me just show you briefly where you can download it and how to install the software. Just get the 64-bit version for your operating system. Then start the installation and just click almost everywhere in next. I recommend to set main as the default branch, but you can also change this after the installation. You can check if Git was installed properly by right clicking in the explorer and opening the git bash here. Now we can type git and see if you get a similar response. The first step that you have to do after installing git is the configuration of your credentials like I am doing it here. Next I am going to search a gitignore template for Unreal. So what is a gitignore file? When you build a project, the compiler will generate files from your source code. You don't want to track those files. In the gitignore file you can define the rules for what you want to track and what you want to ignore. I'm going to copy this. I create a gitignore file in our project folder. And then I paste what I just copied. I also write a comment with this hashtag. And above that I add my own rules to ignore the files generated by Rider, Visual Studio or VS Code. I save and close this. As already mentioned, you can use the CMD like that, or you can open the git bash. The first step is always to type git init to initialize the repository, which is fully contained in this new generated .git folder. When I type git status, you see everything is colored red, which means the state of the files is not tracked and they are also not staged. You can also see that some folders like derived data cache, intermediate and some others aren't even mentioned. This is because they are ignored according to the gitignore file. With git add dot, you can stage the red files. This takes quite a while, but only because we just added the whole project. The second time it's going to be much faster. If you type git status again, you see a lot of green files. They are staged now, which means they are selected to be committed. If you now type git commit minus m for message, I write initial commit. We did our first commit, which is kind of a snapshot of the state of the development process. I write git status again. We see that there's nothing to commit. The working tree is clean, but this would be different if you change a file. If you want to speed up your workflow, you can create aliases, for example, git st instead of git status, or ci for commit, and co for checkout. So this is what I'm using very often. If you type git st, it's going to return the status. Now I want to show you quickly how file changes are reflected in git. I add a file and when I type git st, that file is read, which means it is recognized but not staged. Then with git add, it is staged and with git commit or ci and the trivial message second commit, I again make a snapshot of the state of my files. I change the file. I type git status again to observe what has changed since the last commit. With git add dot, 
I can stage all changed files in the current directory at once and that's what I usually want to do. And now if I type git commit but with the amend parameter I can override the previous commit. I use the same message even if I don't have to. With git log you can see your project history and also that each commit is associated with a hash. I can copy this hash, write git checkout, paste the hash and press enter to check out the state of the project at this point in time. You see that the file just disappeared. With git checkout or co main, because we are on the main branch per default, we can go back to where we have been before. With git init, status, add, commit and checkout, you have a handful of comments that take your development workflow to a whole new level. And with arrow up you can do this very fast through the command line or git bash. I'm going to close this and I also want to delete the git repository by deleting this folder. Alright, let's go to github to publish our repository. The first thing we have to do is creating a new repository. I want it to be public. Maybe you want to choose a private repository. Mm, read me? No. We keep this all like it is because we want to start with a blank repository. We already have a git ignore. Having a readme makes always sense, especially when you want to publish something. So I create that readme.markdown, open it and copy paste the content that I already prepared. Then we should maybe also have something like a license file. Which license to choose depends on the requirements of each individual project, but this is out of the scope of this video. I go with the MIT license for now, which is a very permissive license. Maybe I'm going to change it later on, not sure. I also want to add a file that's called git attributes. It gives attributes to path names. If you read the path, content slash fab, then this double asterisk slash means in all directories, um, match all files, no matter the name, that have a U asset extension. The next line is similar, but now match all files with a U map extension. The right side tells Git to track these files with Git LFS, which stands for large file support. Let me explain. Each copy of a Git repository contains a whole commit history, and each commit contains a full copy of a file if it has been changed. Those changes can be very small in case of text files. For example, changes made to a C++ class could be some lines of code. For binaries such as Unreal Assets or Maps, this is usually not the case. More often, the whole bitstream changes and the Git repo cannot be compressed efficiently. Storing those large files directly would make the repository grow big very quickly, especially if changes are made frequently, like with the level you are currently editing. Git LFS stores only pointers to the different file versions. The files themselves are stored on a remote server. This way, when you clone a repository at a certain commit, you only download one version of a file and not all its versions. So you might ask yourself why I didn't edit the imported files like the starter content to Git LFS. On the one hand, those files are big binaries, but on the other hand, we're never going to change these files. At this point, it might make more sense to you why we handled the important files the way we did in the first video. Another reason is that the free plan of GitHub limits LFS to one gigabyte. Let's now open the git bash again and type git init. See, there's a new git repository. Then git lfs install. Git add dot, which is going to take a while because it stages everything for the first time again. Then commit or ci minus m. For this tutorial series, the commit messages will always be the title of the respective video and the commit always reflects the state of the art at the end of each video. Git status tells me we're on branch main and there's nothing to commit. Let's now connect our Git repository with GitHub. We already created the repository and made our first commits. Now we need to add this remote and push our existing repository to GitHub. So let's copy those lines and paste it in the git bash. After we uploaded all those files, we can refresh this GitHub page and ta-da, here's a project. 
In the bottom of the readme file, you see the links to each video and commit. Please excuse that it might look a little bit different in the end result than in this video. Mm, if you go to content, fab, characters, player, we see that this uasset file is stored with git lfs. Whereas if you go to the files we imported from the starter content pack, and we look for example at that one, we see this is not stored with git lfs. All right, now you know the most important git commands and how to use git from the git bash. This is kind of important to be independent from any graphic user interface. However, if you want to do something more sophisticated, um, you should use a graphic user interface or something like the integration of git in your IDE. Writer does this actually very well. If you go here to commits and change this file, you see the changes are reflected here. I can roll back if I want and the changes disappeared. I change the file again and now I can either directly commit this or I can also do an amend commit just like we did before through the git bash. Be careful though to do the amend commit before you push the changes to github. I could change the default message. However, I actually want to do a second commit. Down here, you can open the skit window and now, after I perform the commit, you can see the second commit in the skit history. The git history is very useful. When I click here, you can see the changes that were made to the files, which are allowed for the first commit. But here for the second commit, it is only this file that has been changed. If I click on this file, then show diff, I can see the difference side by side. When I right click on the file and go to git, then annotate with git blame, I can see for each line who did the changes, which in this case it's only me but in a team that'd be more interesting. And if I hover over the annotation, I'll see the commit hash, email of the author and date. And if you look at the git history at the bottom of the ID, while I click on the annotation, you see the respective entry is getting selected. Whenever you see code and you need some help to understand what it does or why we implemented it that way, you can use git blame to track this back to a commit. And since the commit messages are the video titles, you are going to easily find the video in which the change was made. You can also right click here and undo a commit. Now the second commit disappeared. Mm, the change is still visible here, but I can roll back the uncommitted changes. This kind of rewriting history is easier to do before pushing to GitHub and should be done cautiously in general. Whenever you have a merge conflict, if you don't know what that is, no problem. It happens more often when collaborating in team. But whenever there is a merge conflict, Writer helps to resolve that conflict. You can also right click here and open this on GitHub. Here you can see the commit in your browser. This is a commit hash in this URL. Then there's a commit message. The branch you're working on, the author and the date. You see how many files have been changed. And you can also see the changes themselves. To the right you find the short hash that you can use to check out commits. On the landing page of the repository, there's also a visualization of the history. We can also see that we are working on only one branch. However, if you want to collaborate with other people, you might want to learn how to work with more branches and pull requests and employ a workflow. Like um, for example the GitHub flow. There you have your main or master branch. But if you develop a feature for a game, alone or in a team, you do that on a branch that is created only for this feature. And when everything is working fine, you merge that branch back into the main branch. Workflows can also get more complicated, like you see here, but I recommend not to over-engineer and to start with something easy. GitHub actually also offers you tools to manage your project. This can help a lot if you collaborate in a team. If you create a new project, you can choose from templates like this Kanban board. I give you an example. In this Kanban board, each task moves from the categories to do, in progress, in review, approved, to done. All those tasks are actually issues that you can side peek to see the authors, assignees, labels and more. If you open those tasks, you can also discuss them like normal issues. Let me just give you two more options 
that I can recommend to manage your game development project. I really like to organize my projects with Notion. Here I can manage my knowledge on pages and also have databases for tasks, a common board, a calendar and quite a lot of functionality. It's overall very flexible. If you want to know more about this, there's a link in the video description to the video in which I explain how to create this. Another project management tool that I really like is Codex. It is specific to game development and offers a playful design inspired by card games. I hope I could help with Git, GitHub and give you some ideas how to organize your game development project. If you have any questions, just leave a comment. Don't forget the link to the GitHub commit in the description. And thanks for watching and see you next time.